Hi everybody, my name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor living and working in England and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now, as I promised in my recent update video with all my plans for the new year, there's gonna be a move back towards finals content focused on medical students and PA students to help get them through their qualifying exams. We are gonna be covering 10 chest x-rays that you absolutely must know and must be able to recognize for your final exams. And I think this is important because in your OSCEs and in your long cases, it it is perfectly possible that you may just be given a chest x-ray and asked to make a spot diagnosis. Sometimes with no further thinking or higher reasoning to do, you simply need to be able to spot a particular concerning feature. And of course this means for us when preparing for exams that some of these chest x-rays are going to be so characteristic, so recognisable, that once you've seen them a couple of times you can actually spot them with minimum effort and make them easy marks in the exam. And in this video we're going to go through all 10 and talk about the different findings together. Now first and foremost, if you've not watched my video, Chest X-rays Made Easy, I would really recommend pausing, going and checking that one out and watching that first because it's really important to have a structure and to know the basic anatomy and the structures that you're looking for when trying to interpret a chest x-ray. Two more things before we start. The first is this video is not medical advice and please do not send me your chest x-rays to look at. This is an educational video aimed at physician associate students and medical students to help them pass their exams. It's not a substitute for proper clinical training. It is a revision resource. If you have concerns about a chest x-ray, please speak to your physician. And finally, before we begin, as with all of these finals videos, there is a feedback form in the description below. If you fill that out, that'll get you access to a summary sheet which covers everything that we've talked about in this video. Now, the first one that you obviously need to be able to recognize is a normal chest X-ray. Get used to the normal appearance of the lung fields, the pleura, the bony features, the position of the airway and the heart relative to all of the other structures. It is perfectly possible perfectly reasonable to be given a perfectly normal chest x-ray as part of an OSCE or a long case or indeed in an exam question. Because remember that we don't just randomly do chest x-rays on everyone, we do a chest x-ray looking for something. We're either trying to identify something that is there and is characteristic of a condition or we are trying to rule something out and that is a really important part of your workup process. That might be signs of infection, it might be consolidation, it might be a tumour, it might be something else. The point I'm trying to get at is that we can't rule these things out if we don't know what a normal chest x-ray should look like. So spend a few minutes getting used to the appearance. Now the first pathological x-ray we're going to look at is a pneumonia. Pneumonia is any infection that sits within the lung, specifically within the alveoli. The more typical exam questions will usually involve a homogeneous opacification on a chest x-ray which usually sits within one lobe of the lungs. This, as you might be able to guess, is called a lobar pneumonia. It sits within one lobe. And this is the classical presentation of streptococcus pneumoniae, which again is the most common cause of a lobar pneumonia. There are also atypical pneumonias, which are usually seen as these widespread, more patchy changes within the interstitium, the most common cause being mycoplasma pneumoniae, but we can also think about bugs like Coxiella and Legionella, depending on the question stem and our patient. And lastly, here is an example of an aspiration pneumonia, where solids or liquids are aspirated into the respiratory tract. Erect patients, that is those who are sat up or stood up, are more likely to have aspirated substances move into the basal and middle lobes, whereas a recumbent patient, that's somebody lying down, down, maybe post-surgery, is more likely to have the posterior part of their upper lobe affected as well as the superior part of the lower lobe. Next let's talk about tuberculosis and this is much more common even in the modern world than I think most people think it is. Even here in the UK but especially so in developing nations and we need to be really especially vigilant for it in immunocompromised patients such as those with HIV, immunoglobulin deficiencies and those undergoing chemotherapy. There are two key patterns often associated associated with tuberculosis that I think you do need to be aware of for finals. The first of which is something called a GON focus. This is a primary lesion of tuberculosis, a caseating granuloma, which is caused by infection with Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this can be a source of reactivation further down the line and cause a secondary tuberculosis. Now, obviously remembering how chest x-rays actually work, we can only see these structures if they become calcified. And only about 15% of these structures will become calcified over time, but it does make for a nice spot diagnosis in an exam. The second pattern to look out for is what's called miliary tuberculosis and refers to just widespread hematogenous 
dissemination of the tuberculosis bug. And you can see these small uniform deposits all throughout the lungs. The prognosis if a patient reaches this stage is generally quite poor. And although thankfully this is becoming increasingly rare, it's still one of those ones that will prompt an oh dear when you come across it in practice. Now definitely want to know for Oski's a pneumothorax is what occurs when air or another gas gets into the pleural space between the lungs and the chest wall. Now this can be quite hard to spot admittedly because just as the lungs are full of air which show up as black on a chest x-ray any gas around the lungs will also show up as black. But what that will actually show us is the lung edge. We should not normally be able to see the edge of the lung but because we've now got gas either side of the structure we're now actually able to see the lung edge clearly. So as a general rule, if we can see lung edge and there is black beyond it, that region is most likely a pneumothorax. And in the case of a pneumothorax, we may also not be able to see the lung vessels. Lung vessels obviously appearing white on a chest x-ray and permeating much of the lung. In an especially large pneumothorax, there might be deviation of the trachea and the mediastinum away from the side of the pneumothorax, because obviously you've got gas that is trapped exerting a mass effect on other structures and pushing them out of the way, as well as potentially depression of the hemidiaphragm on the affected side. It should go without saying, please do not miss attention pneumothorax on your exam, that's not a good look. Now for our next one, low bar collapse, as the name suggests, is when one or more of the lungs collapses, and is most commonly related to bronchial obstruction, which causes something called resorptive atelectasis. Now the simplest way to think about this is that because the bronchia are obstructed, ventilation to that lobe of the lung is reduced, and any residual air that is left in the affected lobe is taken into the blood faster than it can be exchanged from fresh air from the outside. Side. And what this does is it simply causes the volume that is in the affected lung to shrink, and thus the lobe has a tendency to collapse. The key features that we're looking for here are air space opacification, although it can take a lot of air loss to actually see it on a film, and collapsed lobes will classically take on this triangular conformation. In particular, the really characteristic one that you'll need to be able to spot is the sail sign. This is associated with a left lower lobe collapse, and is really easy to spot as this triangular density behind the heart. Remember that one well, it is a favourite of examiners everywhere. Next up is a pleural effusion, which is a generalist term that describes fluid in the pleural space, that potential space that exists between the visceral and parietal layers of the pleura. Do remember, however, that there is normally a small amount of fluid in this space just to lubricate the layers of the pleura and keep them adhered together. Now, there are many, many, many causes of pleural effusion, including infection, mesothelioma. In any case, normally what we're looking for is fluid around the diaphragm, because obviously if someone is stood or sat up, Gravity will cause any fluid to collect in the lowest point of the thorax. In practice, this means blunting of both the costophrenic and the cardiophrenic angles. There may even be visible fluid in the lung fissures themselves. And if an effusion is especially large, just like with a pneumothorax, there may be a degree of mass effect and mediastinal shift as the fluid pushes other structures away from itself. And for further investigation of a pleural effusion, you may want to request a lateral decubitus film as well, which will more clearly show you where the fluid is. Now COPD, as you will remember from your respiratory lectures, is chronic airflow limitation linked with persistent inflammation of the airways. Classically, it's associated with bronchitis and emphysema. It has some key reliable signs on a chest x-ray, including a very flattened diaphragm due to hyperexpansion of the chest and overinflation of the lungs, so you'll see more anterior ribs than normal, and if it becomes extreme enough, you may even see something called the floating heart sign, wherein the expansion of the chest is so significant that you can actually see the inferior border of the heart muscle. Now the other feature you could look out for in a COPD film is bullous emphysema. These show up as patchy areas of reduced density with thinning of the pulmonary vessels and these are more likely to appear in the upper lobes of the lungs due to how the disease process works. Now next one of my favourites, and again another reliable favourite of examiners, heart failure. There are five key distinguishing features of heart failure that you should be able to spot on a chest x-ray, which you remember very easily as A, B, C, D, E. A is for alveolar edema, which is signified by these bat wing opacities. B is for curly B lines. Specifically, these are thickened interlobular septa, which sit perpendicularly to the surface of the pleura and extend into it. C is for cardiomegaly, which is something that you can measure. For proper cardiomegaly, the heart muscle should take up at least 50% of the total thoracic window. D is for dilated upper lobe vessels. And then finally, E for pleural effusion, which we have seen before, as the back pressure 
pressure is forcing fluid out into the lung tissue. Now our penultimate entry is a hiatus hernia, and a hiatus hernia is when there is herniation, that is protrusion of a tissue or a structure beyond the wall of the cavity that would normally retain it, from within the abdomen up through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm up into the thorax. Now it can be completely asymptomatic and patients might not know that they've got it, but some patients may describe chest pain, nausea, vomiting, or feeling extremely full even though they've only eaten very small amounts. Very broadly speaking, there are two types of hiatus hernia. Type one or a sliding hiatus hernia, which makes up about 90% of all of them, is when the gastroesophageal junction comes up through the esophageal hiatus and then Type 2 is a rolling or a paraesophageal hiatus. And in this second case, it's actually the gastric fundus which herniates with its characteristic little gas bubble at the top. And this herniates above a normally positioned gastroesophageal junction instead. Now, before all the surgeons come at me, I'm well aware there are more types. They can be discussed another time. But the most common finding to look out for in your hiatus hernia is a retrocardiac opacity behind the heart, which will contain a gas fluid level due to the contents of the stomach. And then finally, number 10, lung cancer. Cancers are obviously one of the most important things to pick up any time we do a chest x-ray for any reason. And it is important to remember that different types of cancer, whether that's your adenocarcinomas, your squamous cell carcinomas, they can have characteristically different appearances on chest x-ray depending on what the malignancy actually is. I'll show you now a few different labelled films as samples. You may see very, very obvious unilateral opacities and areas of attenuation, small nodules, or even just more vague areas of consolidation. You may see enlarged lymph nodes more commonly on one side than both. And don't forget to check the ribs for areas of bony destruction if you've got an invasive lesion. And just a final word on lymphadenopathy, unilateral lymph lymphadenopathy, that is, enlarged lymph nodes on one side, are more commonly associated with cancer or tuberculosis. If you have bilateral and uniform symmetrical lymphadenopathy, you need to be thinking about sarcoidosis or a viral infection. Those are more likely causes of this appearance. So that's where we're going to wrap up this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'd really appreciate it if you found it useful you hit like, shared it with a friend, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future videos in this series. We're going to be looking at ECGs, CT scans and much more besides. And don't forget to go and fill out the feedback form as well to get access to the revision sheet that goes along with this video and the Anki decks. You can take the cards with you on the wards. Take care, I'll see you next time.